I'm here today with David Staley. He is the author of at least a few books. <laughs> Computers, Visualization, and History, which was your first. Mm -hmm. Your latest is now Alternative Universities, but you also wrote Brain, Mind, and Internet, and also History and Future. Mm -hmm. You cover just a little bit in these topics, history and future. I mean, you know, <laughs> minor, minor subject matter. <laughs> Um, Can't decide if I'm coming or going. <laughs> <laughs> Today you're coming, so welcome and thanks for, for joining us. Thank you. And you're fascinating. I, I've heard you talk, I've seen your TED talk, I've seen you talk here at a conference. You are the Director of Humanities at The Ohio State University. You're a futurist who doesn't make predictions. That's right. And you're a futurist who is actually a historian. How does that work exactly? <laughs> Well, I like to tell people that uh, historians make really good futurists, uh, especially if you get away from the idea that, that, that thinking about the future means making predictions. Because if you, if you make a prediction, you're assuming that the future already exists someplace. And I don't believe the future already exists. It's, it's being formed. And I think as historians, we learn, um, we're comfortable with ambiguity, with complexity. We understand that, um, that complex adaptive systems behave in, in, in unpredictable sorts of ways. And so if you approach the future from a perspective of uncertainty, uh, thinking like an historian actually makes you a better futurist. That's compelling. <laughs> Thank but you. I have to say, I know a lot of historians. I don't know any who also have a view of the future so that's 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 probably true I am I am unusual in that regard I suppose y you definitely are so let's talk a little bit about the future technology mm -hmm. AI and I'm thinking in particular of Elon Musk and his dire warnings for the future and I'm curious for you as you as you look at that not making any predictions but as you look at the the future are you more on the worried side or on the hopeful excited side um, I, I, I would tend toward more the hopeful side, uh, though I'm not going to discount the, the, the dark side either. Uh, again, as a futurist, I think in terms of possibilities, but around uh, different probabilities around those possibilities. So the scenario that Elon Musk is laying out, that, that, that AI is going to, to wipe out humanity, yes, I think that's a possible scenario. I also think it's, it's, a, not, it's not a likely scenario. I think more likely is that AI and human intelligence will sort of coexist side by side. And I think the real challenge for us going forward is f designing that interface between, in, uh, between uh, artificial intelligence and human intelligence. Well, you say they'll exist side by side. I was interested in your talk. I'd love for you to share about the Facebook developers and how they had developed an AI and what happened. So uh, uh, unbeknownst to them and unexpectedly, uh, the AI started developing and communicating in its own language. And the engineers shut down the project uh, at that stage because, again, that, that sort of strikes us as something sort of chilling and black mirror-like that, uh, that, that AI would be able to develop a language and would be able to be able to exist maybe without our knowledge or our presence, that they could be engaged in a conversation that, 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 that we wouldn't have any sort of knowledge about. And, and that's, that's chilling to a lot of people. And the question, of course, remains, did they really shut them down? Or did they anticipate the shutdown <laughs> and develop an alternative path? Who knows? Uh, 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 that's a possibility, certainly. Uh, and, but it is the source of the, of the fears of people like Elon Musk and others. It is, it is the source of that fear. Will you also talk about uh, creativity and communities? I saw this yes. in your TED Talk. You were talking about building a creative community. And how do you cre develop a creative community, whether it's in a city? I know we're here in Columbus, which is uh, f fascinating in developing a, a technology future. But whether it's a university or a community or a city, how do you think about creating deliberately a creative environment? So the, uh, the, the TED talk I gave was at uh, TEDx Columbus, and uh, I, was, I was sort of asked to imagine the future of the city. And I said, uh, if, if Columbus really wants to get on the map, it should stop trying to act like, like, act like others, say, American cities. Don't try to be like Portland. Don't try to be like, like, um, like Austin. I said, if you're going to imitate any city, try to be Renaissance Florence. 
you know, Florence in the 15th century. Brunelleschi. <laughs> which is one of the most creative cities in the world. And so. And gorgeous. And, and what I talked about is, so why is it? Why, why was that city, which was smaller than Columbus, why was it this, this sort of hothouse of creativity? And I said, cities like that are ones where um, uh, there, there's a lot of interconnection between creative people, and especially um, those of, of differing ideas. Uh, really creative cities, really creative environments, and that includes universities, are those where different ideas, disparate people are uh, colliding and connecting with each other. Uh, and they produce all kinds of unexpected results. That really is the seat of creativity. Uh, lots of creative people will tell you it's about connecting the unrelated or the, the, the previously unconnected. Cities can do that too. Mm. I often talk about that in the power of diversity because mm -hmm. I think it makes us much better mm -hmm. uh, anticipating and, and responding. Well, a lot of people will, will ask me, I say, oh, I'm talking to this technologist, futurist, who's also a historian, but they don't, <laughs> they don't get that. And they'll say, oh, can he explain something? I say, what is that? What is technology doing to our brains? What is technology doing to our brains? So the fear, the concern is that the more we use technology, the more that we communicate with social media, the more that we rely on Google or Alexa for, for information and knowledge, that it's changing our brains. And the simple answer to that question is, yes, it is. But that that is not uh, something new or unprecedented in human history. In fact, that there's that there, there's some there's some interesting research to suggest that our technologies have always had that effect on our brains. Any new technology, especially cognitive technologies, have this effect. There's interesting research that's being done using functional MRI machines, fMRI machines. You put children in there, children who are learning to read. We can actually watch their brains being changed as they learn how to read. Fascinating. Again, yes, it, it absolutely is. And we don't, no one sort of is worried about that. No one says the book is changing our brains. No one, no one makes it really well. Play. This one will change your yeah. brains for sure. But for some reason, technology uh, and, and its, and its clear-cut effects on changing our brains is, is concerning to people. And I wrote, I wrote Brain, Mind, and Internet as a way to say, step back, put this in a broader historical context. This is not new or unprecedented. It's not to say that there's not problems with it. But the, the idea of technology changing our brains is, is, is not new or, or particularly troublesome, I think. But it is different today where they're talking about Bluetooth and other things kind of literally penetrating your brain, right? Yes. So that would be different than learning or reading. Uh, and the physical sorts of changes that brings about. But, and, and again, with re reading, the brain is physically altered. There, 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 there is a, a, it has to do with uh, brain plasticity. Uh, I think the, most of the concerns about, uh, about technology changing our brains is changing it in directions we don't like. That's, that's the concern. The, 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 the simple sort of physiological fact of the brain changing, there's nothing new about that. Now, we can have a debate, a discussion about where or in the, 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 the directions that technology is leading, leading our brains. Yeah, that could be a very different conversation. Yes, that's a different conversation. Well, alternative universities. Tell, tell us a little bit about this book and uh, how it came to be and what's in it for those who haven't read it. So I posit uh, in the book 10 uh, different models for what universities can be. There, each, each chapter is a sort of a what if exercise. What if we organize a university like this? What if we organize it like this? It starts from, um, from a sort of intellectual exercise I engaged in uh, around the purpose and function of universities. Why do we have universities at all, as opposed to something else? And so uh, each one of the, the, the models I describe here, it, it really has that question at heart. What's the purpose of higher education? What's the, what's the function? And then the idea here is to posit different possible ideas for what universities can be. And you go through a number of them. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite in there is Interface University. Interface it's University. Kind of combining things. And you have another one I found interesting as well where it was, I forget the name of it, but you required three different disparate majors, That's right. which I really like that too. Polymath University is the name for it. Yeah, so, uh, so the, the, the chapter sort of lays out what that university would look like and then writes a, a longer sort of uh, description justification. But as you say, it's a, it's a university where every student to graduate would have to major in three disciplines, but three very different disciplines. So they couldn't major in, say, history, philosophy, and English. 
Too close. Too close. Or finance, accounting, and business administration. They would have to major in business administration and philosophy and theater. Leave instance. it to the educator to take the four-year experience to 10, is what you're saying. <laughs> well, and the idea is uh, to, uh, to, to keep it within four years, there wouldn't be uh, general education. You wouldn't need it, I guess. Exactly, yes. Uh, the, the, the general education would come from the, the, the different majors. There's interesting research on students who double major and who double major in very different disciplines. And the quality of their brains, the, the, the quality of their thinking, they're more creative, for instance. Well, imagine if that uh, were three different uh, majors that students would have to master. It would produce a very interesting, very creative student. It, it really would. And uh, I, I know a few people who have majored in mm -hmm. very dif different things, and their brains do seem to operate in a different way. You, you, we, know, we all know people like that. And so that, that university is based on exactly that sort of, that sort of person. Well, I love the perspective from a humanities perspective and from an educational perspective that education is not simply about acquiring a job, right. but about the quality of your thinking and uh, contributing to society. But leaving that aside, a lot of people are concerned about education for their job. And so I'm interested as we look at the future, what jobs are most at risk at what jobs do you think will last? Is there a way to categorize that, or do you have a current view? And I guess it will change constantly. But what is it today? If you were saying, if you were giving advice to someone who said, "I want a secure job in the future," <laughs> what would you say to to do? Uh, the, the simple answer would be a, a job that isn't easily automated, and I think that that's that's what most people are, are concerned about now uh, about automation. A lot. So the idea of automation is not new. Uh, I've made the argument that at least since the Industrial Revolution, jobs have been automated by machines. What's different today is that the kinds of jobs or the kinds of tasks that are being automated are what we would call like cognitive tasks or, or white collar jobs. In the past, it, the, the sorts of jobs that are automated tend to be sort of physical labor jobs. What's different today is, uh, is now cognitive labor. Um, Certain practices in the law, accounting, for instance, are being are being automated. It's incredible, and that leads to the kinds of questions that you're asking. Well, what job is safe? What is what is it that I can? What is it that I can do? And I think that any job that isn't easily automated is is safe, and that covers a. a it's a, hard a to wide know today. Yes, yeah. and I think at least for the moment, any job that uh, requires creativity, imagination, uh, the sorts of things that I think are uniquely human. Right now, machines don't have those capacities. Um, it seems every day, though, that the lines are blurred. I, I remember uh, recently reading this huge auction of the AI created art, and I thought, yes. well, art is so creative, right? Could never ever have an AI create art, and then lo and behold, I'm wrong. Yes. Out it comes. So and music too. Music. The the the, the question is, um, are the are the is AI being intentional in their creativity? In other words, um, uh, a, a computer scientist or an artist can train or instruct a machine to produce art or to create music. Uh, AI isn't yet saying, I'm going to create a sonata today, or I think I'm going to engage in painting, or here's what I want my painting to say or reveal. Um, AI doesn't yet have that kind of intentionality. And I keep saying yet because I'm trying to hedge my bet here. But as of the moment, those are still uniquely human abilities. Well, education for kids changing a lot. In the talk that I heard you give, you were talking about how we used to educate for fact, I'm going to paraphrase you, mm -hmm. but fact regurgitation is mm -hmm. what I was thinking. Just can you give back the facts? And yes, you can. And you were talking about the, the move toward asking questions, asking yes. good questions. Talk a little bit about how education is changing or you see it evolving in this environment. Uh, it's changing very slowly. Where I would like to see it evolve is away from the, the testing regime. And the testing regimes we have now are all about answers, about, about young people producing answers on demand. That's, what, that's the, the nature of testing. What's the, the reality, though, is that answers are pretty easy to come up with. I can pull out my phone and say, give me an answer to this question. Or I can ask Alexa or my, or my Amazon Echo or something like that, what's the answer to, to such and such a question? So being able to produce answers is going to, it, it, it's going to look unusual or Less odd, valuable. Less valuable. Asking questions, on the other hand, is, I think, still a uniquely human ability. 
and one that we don't necessarily educate for. And I see education moving in this direction. When answers are so readily available through technology, it's the ability to ask the right questions, the big questions, the complex questions that will be one mark of an educated person. It's interesting. You, you gave me a, a fear of uh, going to law school, Socratic method. Now you're taking it all the way <laughs> into the kids. So. Yes, indeed. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely going to change anything. Well, uh, also, you mentioned reading and reading at scale. You're talking about research and even reading humanities works, et cetera, and how AI is able to scan and quote read thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe a million books, mm -hmm. and that changes the nature of, of research. How do you see that evolving with AI? So uh, some of the work that I engage in uh, is in what's called the digital humanities. And one feature of the digital humanities is the process that you described right there, that we can, that we can take an entire corpus, one that's been digit, digitized, for instance. We can take an entire corpus and working with algorithms, working with AI, we can read. I'm going to put read in quotation marks at this stage, but we can scan and detect patterns and to see, um, uh, see um, um, patterns in a corpus at a, at, a, at a macro scale that we can't necessarily see at the micro scale of individual books or individual works. And so there's, a, there's an approach in the digital humanities now. It goes by different names, reading at scale, uh, macro analysis, uh, but it describes exactly what you're saying right there. If you could read an entire library, if you could, uh, if you could read um, uh, all the books that are contained in, say, like Google Books, uh, what patterns could I'm you see in a effort, macro scale? Every effort. I'm making yes. every effort to do that, but and it's taking I, a long time. And I won't say this is, this is not controversial because it absolutely is, uh, and because the argument I would make is that reading a book, reading an individual book is one way of reading, and you, you can extract meaning uh, at the level. But you can also extract meaning at this macro level as well, and that, that macro level meaning won't just simply be the piling up of individual books or individual articles. It'll be a different sort of, different sort of pattern. It is interesting today because we, we call an expert somebody who's read 20 books in a subject. Right. <laughs> right? I mean, that's, oh, you're an expert in such and such. And that's a completely different expertise, and taking that top level with the bottom level and marrying them will be an interesting uh, change. Well, your um, unusual history and future together, I'm thinking about the recent tragic fire at Notre Dame and uh, the fire just really causing havoc f from, I mean, it's, it grieves people who love mm -hmm. both the, uh, the history and, and the beauty of the architecture. How, if at all, can AI and technology help with the rebuilding of uh, Notre Dame? So Notre Dame is a, is a particular case uh, because it is, it is one architectural structure that has been uh, scanned, uh, uh, scanned extensively. So there are all kinds of 3D models uh, and other kinds of high resolution scans that have been done to Notre Dame before the fire. And so as part of the reconstruction efforts, um, I'm certain that those virtual uh, models are going to be consulted as part of the reconstruction process. Can we have a print-on-demand Notre Dame? Uh, not quite <laughs> yet, uh, but, uh, but potentially. Uh, in fact, there's some early experiments that are being doing with, uh, with, with 3D printing architectural forms. But uh, that sort of work, sort of creating virtual reality models uh, of, of environments, uh, that's something that already exists today. They've done it, for instance, with the, um, the cave paintings at Lascaux. Mm -hmm. which, and you want to try to keep the number of people down in those environments. You have, you have lots of people going into those caves. It actually causes, causes problems uh, to them. But you and I can go online today and take a virtual tour. It's obviously not the same thing, uh, but uh, especially with virtual reality lenses, uh, it will, will reach a stage where we can have a pretty darn good approximation uh, of those kinds of environments. And we'll be able to do all kinds of interesting things. It's amazing. Really. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Without even leaving, you can be a traveling and exploring the exactly, world. Exactly, from your office. And you can also be going back in the past. That's going to be another application that we'll be able to put on virtual reality glasses and say, let's go back to here, Lincoln, give the Gettysburg Address, or let's go to an, to an early factory in Manchester and experience it that way. Amazing. Hmm? If that's future and history together, mm -hmm. for it sure. It absolutely is. 
So we have covered uh, all kinds of topics from art to education to future to history to Notre Dame to, I mean, and, and that's what's so fascinating about talking to you. I could talk and ask you questions about all of this. Um, just want to reflect for a moment, is there anything that leaders who are leading organizations, taking all, all of that in, should be doing with their uh, workforce to think about, you know, helping them with the skills that are required or in the community that they're in to be more creative? What should leaders be thinking about? What should I be thinking about? So um, I, I give a talk, uh, and because I absolutely believe this, that uh, if you are the leader of an organization, any, any sort of organization, you are by definition a futurist. I don't know if you realize that or not, Skip, but you, you are a futurist. Strategy and... Well, who else in the organization is looking ahead, looking over the horizon, thinking about what's next, uh, and especially with the goal of being able to position the organization to thrive in such an environment? That is the definition of what a futurist does. And again, any leader of any organization is doing the same thing. So I, I, I give a talk where I lay out 10 habits of mind that futurists practice, and it turns out that a lot of those align with the kinds of habits of mind that we'd expect from, from, a, from a leader. So asking good questions, thinking in systems, um, having strategic peripheral vision. In other words, looking mm -hmm. not just simply ahead, but looking uh, in, in adjacent and even non-adjacent industries for sources of change. All leaders, though, are futurists. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they don't realize that, I think it's, it's a skill, it's, an, it's a set of abilities that leaders can develop. I think that's fantastic, and I haven't heard that particular talk of yours, but it sounds like it could be a great next book. So we keep the uh, the book thing going. That's that's a great That's one. a super idea. Yeah, actually. it's really good. <laughs> so thank you so much for talking to us briefly about all of this. The world's changing so fast that um, it's great to check in and to see you looking ahead and back and you seem happy and well-adjusted and normal, <laughs> so I thought that was a good thing. There's no panic on, on, your, uh, on your face. You're just kind of going. Keep with calm. It. You're calm through it all. So thank you so much, and what a great, fascinating new book, Alternative Universities, which uh, is designed to spark a lot of ideas and be provocative in the education space, but those same ideas and concepts you can use in industry and other places to think, well, what about alternative organizations, alternative companies, et cetera? You can line them up and be creative about that. So uh, it is a very fascinating look into design and thinking of the future. So thanks so much for coming in and talking with me today. Thank you, Skip. Thanks, thanks. very much.